Hello, Garland Nixon here, and uh, we're going to talk about something that's not discussed. You know, we we hear people talk about America's dirty war on Syria uh, that went on for years that Russia intervened. Let's talk about America's dirty war on Russia and China. Very important. And China. Let's talk. Hello, Garland Nixon here, um, and I see people in the uh, I see people in the chat saying something about YouTube error. I don't know, uh, but whatever the case may be, <clears throat> um, today we're gonna today we're gonna talk about uh, Russia, China. For all I know, I could have put the time wrong time or something in it. Who knows? You know, I can't be YouTube screwed up, and so am I. But let's talk about Russia's dirty war on Russia and. China. Let's start with the um, let's start with the title. It's very it's critical that I I, I got to start adding China to this for this reason, because you got two kind of schmucks in the United States. Right. You got schmucks that are completely um, brainwashed. Those are the, the I would call I'm going to just use the two parties. So don't it doesn't have to be the two parties. But, but for the for the um, effectively, we're going to use the two parties here. Right. You got the idiot liberals. The, the, the Democratic Party that's either just plain stupid or brainwashed. And if the system tells them to walk into a tree, they'll have a smashed face tomorrow because they'll walk right into a tree. Right. So you've got these people that when the system says Russia, 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 they say, well, they've sure. Did they lie to me about everything in the past? Absolutely. But I think this time they're probably telling the truth. Russia's the evil one. And therefore, I must get behind the CIA and the uh, the uh, the National Endowment for Democracy and all of the evil neocons and join them in their quest to take Russia out. A faulty quest, though it may be. I believe everything they tell us, tell me in the Washington Post and the New York Times. Therefore, doggone it, Russia it is. Now, then you have what I probably call the people that are even worse, right? Th these are the people to me that are worse. It's one thing if you're just a schmuck. If somebody just tells you to walk into a tree and you walk straight into a tree, okay, you're a schmuck, right? You're an idiot and you're going to walk into a tree. Here's to me what's worse. If you look at somebody and you say, man, that guy's a schmuck. What an idiot. Can you believe that the system tells him to walk into a tree and slam Ola right into a tree and you laugh and you sit around and talk about how stupid that guy is, right? And you just say, I can't believe you would trust these people. These neocons are my enemies. These uh, Wall Street's my enemy. These people are my enemies. For God's sake, they're trying to screw us. And you believe them when they tell you that Russia's doing this or that? Can't you see how blatant it is? And you sit and you laugh at them. And then the system says to you, you know, it's not really Russia that's your enemy. And you're like, oh, really? Oh, like I'm going to believe you, system, you criminal liars. I'll never believe you again. And they say, mm, 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 mm. yeah, we're, you know, certainly, I mean, I've lied to you in the past, but I got you straight this time. Your true enemy is China. And instead of doing of the obvious, instead of saying, why would I trust you? You've lied to me all the time. In fact, I can see that you're lying to the Russia idiots. You fooled them with Russia Gate, and they believed it because they hated Trump. You should be looking at it saying, I would never believe you. Look, you can't tell me who my enemies are. So when the same people, Joe Biden, John Bolton, uh, and all of these people, the same people who tell you that, tell all of these idiots that Russia is their enemy and you laughed at them and they come to you and say, uh, it's really China that's your enemy. You're like, yeah, you know. I got you got I'm with you on this one. Sure, the Russia thing was a bunch of idiots. Why, why would anybody ever believe you? Only a moron would believe you. 
But you know, you're telling me that China is my enemy. And I, I think you're probably genuine on this one. I think, sure, your history is lying, of lying. And I laughed at anybody who believed you. But you know, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head with this China thing. Yeah, that's it. China's my enemy. Those people are stupider. They're far stupider than the Russia idiots. Far stupider. The Russia idiots are what they are. You know, come on. Uh, yeah, they're, they're getting it, right? But those who can see the fault of the, those who listen to the lies and Russiagate and all of that, and then repeat the same exact lie, yeah, uh, it, there's no hope for them because they have accurate knowledge. They understand what they're up against. They understand that these people are liars and yet they bite the hook. I have less respect for them than I do for the uh, for the for the China sucker and uh, the Russia suckers. I got less respect for the China suckers than I do for the Russia suckers. Now let's move on from that. I had to say that I got no respect for them. I sit there and I'm like, yeah. I put it like this. I feel like this. There's more hope for the Russia suckers than there are for the China suckers because the Russian suckers are only one level of stupidity. You know, they're just like they've had it thrown in their lap and ah, they still trust the system. They turn on MSNBC, CNN, Russia, 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 Trump, 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 Trump. And they're like, yeah, uh, Russia, Trump, something or other. Right. OK. But the China suckers are two levels down. When you can see somebody else get had by someone. In other words, you watch me pick this guy's pocket. And you say, how stupid is it? And I walk over and I sell a guy, I, I pick his pocket and I sell him his own wallet. And you're like, oh boy, man, <laughs> that guy's an idiot. And then I walk up to you, would you like to buy a wallet? And you look at it and you're like, you know, that just looks exactly like my wallet. And funny thing, I can't find my wallet. I might as well buy that one. Can you open it up? Holy crap, it has my driver's license and everything in it. What a coincidence. How much are you asking for that wallet, buddy? At least that guy didn't see somebody else. He didn't see me pick somebody else's pocket and sell them their own wallet. You watch me do it and then bought your own wallet from me. You're far stupider than those people. I, I just can't respect the, the, the China idiots. Whoa, but it's the Chinese Communist Party. So we've got to be far stupider than anybody else because they're communists. It's amazing to me. Just, just I just sit back as an observer and I'm like... <clears throat> You know, if we get nuked, we kind of got to come in. You know, maybe we, maybe the earth needs to be cleansed of idiots. The kind of, you know, you'll notice me getting a, a little animated. Idiots. This kind of stupidity really can't escape this planet. It has to be maintained, contained, or washed away here. Because the level of stupidity that we have in the West right now, just the rest of the world doesn't need to be cleansed. But just the West, because the level of stupidity that we have here is without equal in the history of humankind. I thought, you know, I looked at like medieval times and how they tortured people and they thought all information was revealed by God. And if you said, well, you know, perhaps the planets are circling us, they would burn you at the stake. I thought those people were not stupid. Oh, no, they were not stupid. At least they didn't have a reference point. We have a reference point. We can literally see the same people lying to us and we know they're lying. And we have online like shows like this that says, hey, those people are lying. And, and then we can agree. Yes, sir. They are liars. And then they come to us with a new lie. Hey, what about China? Yeah, sure. Tell me. I'm all ears. Have you ever lied to me before? OK, fair, fair enough. You have. But I trust you this time. Yeah, uh, it's pretty pathetic. OK, um, so let's, I just had to start off with that because I'm sure there'll be somebody in the chat inevitably, no, but Garland, Biden and Newland and Blinken, John Bolton, all of those people. Yeah, they really, they're, they're really telling us the truth about China. I trust them on China. They're right. They're, they, they're, I'm telling you, Biden's got that China thing, man. He's that, the China thing, Biden and Newland and Blinken and Sullivan and all of those people. Yeah, everything else they got is wrong, except China. I got no respect for somebody like that. If you're that stupid, I don't even know. You know, I'm, I may be losing viewers. Good, good. If you're that stupid, I would prefer not to associate with people who are that stupid. If you, I mean, I just got to be frank. 
Um, anyway, so let's go on. Stupidity, you know, it's like a virus. Maybe I can get some boosters, some anti-stupidity boosters. That's what I need because these uh, I've had stuff on. The reason I'm reacting like this is I've gotten like emails from people. Well, you know, Garland, I think this China thing now, I don't like Biden. When it comes to China, man, I think he's he's pretty straight on that one. And I'm like, oh, key per, uh, <laughs> block. I, I, I can't associate with people of that le- with, with have that le- who have that level of ignorance. All right, let's continue. Um, th- let's talk about the issue of a dirt. The, and, and I had to add China because the dirty war on Russia and China and Russia. See, here's the thing about it. <clears throat> Russia and China understand this. They understand this. They understand that it's a dirty war. And the reason that I said so the first I heard of the term dirty war was from Aaron Mate, right? Or Aaron Mate uh <clears throat> Um, love him. I think people like him and a lot of other people um, are learning some realities um, that some of us already know. But I like, uh, uh, you know, there were a lot of people. I can't say for sure that Aaron Mate did this, but I think there were a lot of people who were very knowledgeable and, and wise about U.S. foreign policy who during the 2020 election still had this concern. They still had a little bit of Trump derangement syndrome in that they thought, well, we've got to get Biden in because Biden will be better than Trump. And there were those of us who said, you got to be freaking kidding me. Biden, Biden's not better than anybody. You might as well had John McCain. You might as well had John Bolton, right? If you got, so there were, I, 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 I'm not sure. I think, and, and I'm a big fan of Mate. He does brilliant work on a lot of good things, but there are times I disagree with him. Uh, but at any rate, um, but he's a good guy overall. Love his work. A uh, big, big fan. Uh, but at any rate, um, he talked about the Syrian dirty war. He did a lot of good work on that. Uh, always check on, uh, uh, follow his stuff on the dirty war on um, uh, um, Russia Gate. But at any rate, um, and he talked about the dirty war and my interpretation of the dirty war, because I've never really seen a clear um, a definition of it like a formal definition of it, but I think an informal definition of it would be my, would, is your, your, so if there's no formal, you have to come up with your own. I think it, it includes, um, number one, proxy military acts, wherein you have some kind of a proxy military. It was ISIS, like so, such as the Al-Nusra front, right, in, in uh, Syria. So you have to have a military proxy who can do vi- take violent terrorist actions and hopefully traditional military actions. That violent proxy front will be armed, will be provided, will be trained, and will be uh, provided with intelligence. So you can use them kind of like a political and a military tool. Um, Additionally, uh, a dirty war enlists the the, the, uh, abilities of your intelligence community at the forefront. That I think that's the key to a dirty war is that the intelligence community is on the leading edge of it. The intelligence community is involved in because you can't just take a um, a box of uh, weapons and say, hey, uh, you know, let's FedEx, them, excuse me, let's ship them directly to uh, ISIS. You've got to find a circu- circuitous route to get them there so that they don't have your fingerprints all over it. Right. And you, you got to get AK-47s because, you know, they can't just be walking around with American weapons. So you're in a traditional dirty war. You find ways. Uh, Haiti. Haiti is, is a U.S. dirty war on Haiti. Same exact. If you understand Haiti and all the problems in Haiti, you understand that the U.S. has waged a dirty war on Haiti. If you look, you've got these gangs and they're all armed. They're armed by the oligarchs of Haiti. And the oligarchs of Haiti are able to arm them because they smuggle weapons through France, through Canada, through the U.S. to the gangs. And now they're having a problem because the gangs are turning on them. The gangs are waking up and saying, hey, rather than fight um, each other, let's maybe fight these in U.S. and French uh, invaders. Right. So they're having problems in Haiti. So they have to demonize now demonize the very gangs that they were uh, arming and supporting and use utilizing as political and military tools. So anytime to me, anytime you see a proxy force that is armed and used as a military tool, there's going to be a dirty war. That's an indication that the dirty war is going on. And you can look for these other factors and you can look for the CIA, the intelligence communities to be at the forefront of a dirty war. Um, And and so you have um, 
the the intelligence community will enlist their uh, allies. That's a good word for it. We could use a stronger word in the U.S. media and in Hollywood. Um, uh, here's an example. In Syria, the intelligence community uh, put together this uh, uh, movie. I think it was called Cries for Syria or something like that, right? They also put together a documentary. They put together a documentary on the White Helmets, which was, again, a proxy PR force for the intelligence community. And they uh, sent them to Hollywood. And of course, they get an Oscar or something like that. Right. So now they've they put together some Navalny a thing against Russia, which is part of the dirty war in Russia, goes through Hollywood, gets an Oscar. Right. Um, Zelensky's all over Hollywood. That that's one of the things that tells you it's a dirty war. It's going to be all over Hollywood. Hollywood is a political tool. It's a media related tool for um, the U.S. empire, for the intelligence community. And when you see Hollywood all over an issue you know for sure that that's part of the dirty war. So actually part of one of the tools in the dirty war, in a dirty war is Hollywood, a very, very important tool. Um, if you think about it, the, the in Navalny, this movie Navalny, um, this uh, White Helmets movie, right? These things got uh, Oscars, right? Do you know anybody that saw them? Do you know anybody that saw them? Does anybody know anybody that saw them? They put these things together. They put them out as if people were going to watch them. People didn't really watch them. And they gave them an Oscar. And from, I know, actually, I know one person that watched them both. And he said they were garbage. They weren't well put together, right? They were well put together in that you could see there was a lot of money behind them. There was a lot of effort behind them and stuff like that. There was unlimited finances behind them. And there was access Right. Whoever did them, intelligence community, could provide powerful, powerful access. Right. So the bottom. And in fact, I'll say this. This one of the propaganda movies was called Cries. I think Cries for Syria. Right. When Oliver Stone did a. Um, uh, a documentary called Ukraine on Fire, which is an excellent document about Ukraine. The U.S. Empire did a competing one called Winter Fire. And one of the one of the tricks that they use using one of their political tools of Google is that when people search for Ukraine on fire, Winter Fire will pop up and they try to confuse people. You'll notice the name, you know, Winter Fire, whatever. Right. And so what they try to do is get people who are looking for Ukraine on fire to see the propaganda movie Winter Fire. But here's the interesting thing. This movie cries for Syria or cry on Syria or whatever the case may be. Um, the same exact guy did that as did the Ukraine's the, the winter fire. So they used the same director for a propaganda movie in Ukraine as they did for on Ukraine as they did for a crop propaganda movie on Syria. Accident. Right. These are U.S. empire moves. These are dirty wars. And he's one of the tools. And then, of course, they use the same channels to get these things to Hollywood. And you can see that I suspect coming up, there's going to be a cries for Taiwan or some something come. There's definitely one coming up for Taiwan and it's going to uh, be a documentary or whatever on what China's doing for to Xinjiang or Taiwan or whatever. And then, of course, it'll be through Hollywood and it'll get an Oscar and all the same idiots. Um, who call themselves conservatives, who laughed at the uh, liberals and, and pointed and snickered at them for being stupid enough to buy all of the crap, uh, the, all of the propaganda about um, Russia will probably like share it on all of their rumble channels. Hey, did you see the latest documentary on Xinjiang and Taiwan? It's excellent. We got to watch it. The Chinese Communist Party is evil. Don't forget that. Because, man, the CIA really got it right on this time. They finally, after all these years of lying and cheating and stealing, they finally figured out that China's the real enemy. I'm down with that, right? You'll see the conservative idiots do that. But it's coming. If they, They're working on it right now. Probably use the same guy who directed the cries for Syria or whatever the hell it is in Ukraine winter fire. He's probably working on a documentary right now for Taiwan, Xinjiang, Kinmen Islands, whatever the hell. And the suckers are waiting to bite the hook like a bunch of carp and catfish. Right. In a in a in a mud hole. Um, anyway, let me continue. <clears throat> so um, that's the key. Number one. Right. Is to have a proxy military that you arm clandestinely or otherwise. Number two, you've got to have 
the intelligence community at the leading edge of it, which includes a number of things, which is, of course, stories and articles going to the U.S. media and the Western media. There's going to be some sort of a documentary that is, you know, goes to Hollywood and Hollywood's involved in it. And then, of course, and you're going to intricately get Hollywood involved in it. Um, and then, of course, at some point, um, you're going to do want your false flags or your fake stuff that even if it doesn't happen, you're going to pretend there was a false flag. What do we have in Syria? Oh, my God, the Syrians have used some kind of horrible nerve gas, which they don't even have. And then, of course, as, as that starts to get questioned and fall apart, if you look at the whole Syrians use, used weapons of, of mass destruction, it started with Syria used sarin nerve gas. And then that changed to, no, um, the tests in the area found chlorine, which is bleach. So you're like, yeah, uh, Syria used bleach. They dropped a bomb with just bleach in it because, hey, they wanted their clothes to be white and fluffy. So they dropped it. You know what I mean? When you're dropping uh, bombs on people, you civilians, you want to make sure that their clothes are white and fluffy. Make sure you get plenty of bleach in it because, boy, that's a good idea to drop bleach bombs. Who doesn't do that if they're not an evil leader? So and of course, we find, come to find out. I, I mean, it didn't take long to look into the old bleach bomb story of what bleach bombs of mass destruction story in which you find out that the Syrians and the Russians cleared an area out of um, terrorists, of the ISIS-style people. They made an agreement with them. They put the ISIS people and their families on buses. They evacuated them from the area. The people in the area started cheering, hooray, the Syrian government has cleared out the terrorists and freed us, and thank God the Syrian government and Assad came in and got rid of ISIS in this area, and we're free. And then we're to believe at that point, the Syrian government then dropped bombs, which had bleach in them, on the people in the region, killing lots of people because you know how deadly bleach is. If it gets on you, one drop, it's kind of like Novichok, you know, gets on you, one drop kills a million people, but nobody really dies of it. I don't know. So that was it. You, you got bleach bombs, you got um, terrorist proxy armies, and you got Hollywood and all kinds of media crap. And the boom, you add that stuff together, you got a dirty war, right? Okay. Ever heard of Bucha? Buko, whatever it is, right? What do we have? We've got the U.S. in uh, and its proxies in in Ukraine doing a dirty war. There's they're like every time you turn around, there's like, oh look, the Russians have killed lots of people in Buka, right? They've uh, they've they've uh, uh, come in and they've slaughtered everybody and uh, they've shot them in the head and tied them up. And we come to find out that um, people in that area were mostly Russian supporting people in the area where the Russians supposedly killed. So the Russians went in and they killed a bunch of people who support Russia. And of course, the false flag goes forward and the uh, perpetrators of it say, yes, uh, Russia did a terrible thing. They killed you know, hundreds of people, whatever. It's a war crime. And then within a couple months, it was over. It was gone. You know, if the Russians, so the Russians said, well, you know what? That didn't happen. But here's what we need. Let's just let the uh, UN Security Council, the United Nations, come in and do an investigation. So we, you know, you've accused us of a war crime. You've accused us of all of this crap in Buka. So um, it's kind of odd that uh, supposedly the people were killed, their bodies laid there for four days, and then um, there was no deterioration of the bodies or anything in four days. And people just walked around for four days and just stepped over the bodies. And they, nobody happened to notice them or see them there for four days. Isn't that weird? So why don't we let the UN come in and we'll cooperate and you can cooperate and do an investigation into the old Buka massacre to which the U.S. Empire was like, oh, no, we don't need an investigation by the Come on, an investigation by the uh, UN? Nah, we we know you did it. We don't need an investigation. Kind of like Nord Stream, right? The US blows Nord Stream and Russia says, we need an investigation. And the US says, nah, Sweden's handling that. We don't, uh, Denmark, they're handling that. We don't need the UN to come in and do an investigation. Certainly wouldn't want that. Uh, we, we got uh, a valid uh, people or experts in there looking into that. We'll sure that'll get. We're sure that'll get straight. And then here in the last week, uh, Denmark and Sweden come out and say, "Yeah, we don't. Ha we don't have jurisdiction for this investigation. So uh, we're just going to close it." 
okay, well, give us what you got. You know, okay, well, give us what you don't have jurisdiction. That, well, then I guess that means you'll release the evidence to the UN Security Council. So somebody that just does has, have jurisdiction can look into it. Yeah, now nah, we're not going to do that either because uh, it's the national security. I, everybody knows. So what do we have here? We've got a false false flag after false flag. Ukraine is a false flag factory. You know, they've blown up everything but the false flag factories for, for some reason in, in Ukraine. And of course, everybody knows who blew Nord Stream, right? Everybody knows that the Biden people blew Nord Stream. So again, that's part of the dirty war. One could make an argument, if you think about it, that Ukraine is not just a dirty war on Russia, that it's a dirty war on the on the um, the European continent. You know what I mean? I mean, let's face it, look up Op Operation Gladio. That was a dirty war on the European continent. The U.S. and its uh, intelligence uh, agencies have a long history of dirty wars on the entire European continent to make sure that the Europeans do not in any way, shape or form have independence, have sovereignty, have uh, democratic uh, machination. So the working class and the mass and the uh, masses can um, have governments that uh, act on their best interests. The U.S. ain't going to have that. So we've got Hollywood right? It, uh, doing, uh, you know, their thing. Every time you turn around, you've got uh, uh, a number of people from Hollywood. Remember when the special military operation started, you had all these people from Hollywood who were traveling to um, Ukraine to hang out with Zelensky or whoever. You had John Stewart and people like that who were pinning medals on Nazis. You had, uh, you know, um, uh, um, people from Hollywood, you know, the late night shows, um, Jimmy Fallon and these people who are all cheerleaders for the neocons and for the, uh, uh, you know, the intelligence community in, uh, in um, uh, Ukraine. You had 60 Minutes doing its usual, literally 60 Minutes had on people, uh, uh, intelligence operatives, um, uh, from all over the world, UK, etc., coming in there, Ben, uh, what's the guy's name, Nimo or whatever, um, people from Bellingcat, uh, etc., doing their dirty work. 60 Minutes is certainly one of the Hollywood tools that's used, one of the, you know, media tools um, that's used by the um, intelligence community. So you had all of that going on. And of course, you had a proxy army. I think the difference in um, in Ukraine was that uh, the U.S. was not able to, there was no opportunity for the U.S. to hide their direct connections to their proxy army. So they went in the other direction. They just said, we will openly support our proxy army. We will really focus on um, our uh, intelligence operations on the American people. Well, folks is really, really strong on that. So much so that every time you turn around, that blue and yellow is all over the place. You know, I remember when the special military operation started all around D.C., you had these operations. I mean, you had these buildings that are being built, right? They're building a skyscraper. They're building this. You can still see it now some places. And, you know, they'll put this colored paper like they'll build a wall and they'll put this colored paper around the wall. Right. They were putting blue and yellow colored paper around the walls. They were literally using the colors of the flag of Ukraine all over the place, just as a subtle brainwashing technique for people. In um, all over Europe, you had trains, you had all kinds of everything that the government could do. They were painting that blue and yellow color of the Ukrainian flag. So what you had was all kinds of both um, obvious and subtle um, uh, 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 intelligence operations to brainwash the people in the West to support Ukraine. And that, again, the intelligence community using their assets in the media, using their assets, their corporate assets everywhere, right? Okay, corporations, we need you to spray paint this color, these things, this color, and the corporate corporate assets are like, we're down because we understand as, uh, what's the guy's name? Friedman said, you don't have uh, McDonald's without McDonald Douglas, right? They understood that the foundation of corporate power in the United States is military power and economic coercion, that it is the coercive nature of U.S. imperialism that allows the corporations access to um, raw material and cheap labor all over the world that allows them to make 
sky high profits because they pay little for their uh, labor. They pay little for their the natural resources that they need. And boom, I can make things for next to nothing and sell them for a high price in the U.S. and, and, and Europe. So they understand that when the government says we need you as part of this operation, that it is critical that they join the government as part of cooperation. That that's, you know, how they that's how they eat, bottom line. So what we have now is a full fledged dirty war on Russia and China and Russia and China understand it. You know, one of the interesting things uh, when, if we talk about China and we talk about the issue of censorship, right? <clears throat> The U.S., this is what you hear all the time. China doesn't have freedom. China, um, as if the U.S., like we got freedom and we have the um, uh, uh, a moral high ground. Again, um, Americans are at their found, you know, uh, at, the, at its foundation. Americans are treated to be, taught to be um, supremacist, a uh, U.S. supremacist and imperialist, right? That even as our country crumbles economically, our economic system of neoliberal capitalism is unsustainable. And in fact, it's imploding. It's crashing in its own weight, right? Our uh, cultural system is falling apart. It's crashing. What the hell are we talking about? You know, you've got very serious issues for the commoners. You've got homelessness and all the uh, system wants to talk about is niche, niche, um, cultural issues of trans rights or something like that, right? Wherein you got homeless people all over the place. You got people starving all over the place. You got um, uh, 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 instability. You got mass shootings. You got all of this. And our culture, our system tells us we got to be concerned with the trans rights first and foremost. Now, that is not to say that the rights of any particular group should be subordinated to the bottom. That's simply to say the reality is you got to have priorities. And when your economic and cultural system is imploding, picking out a group that's one half of one half of one half of one percent of your population and saying their rights are our priority, when at the same time, lots of other groups' rights are being uh, crushed. It, 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 it's obvious they're not doing that because they're concerned about trans people. That's not the motivation here. There's not a real concern about trans people. There, that's an issue that's being used to distract us, to um, create an environment where we're not asking questions about why they're screwing us over economically, why they're starting wars around the world, et cetera. It's just another political tool that can be used. It has nothing to do with trans people. It's not when the U.S. government says I'm out for trans rights, that don't mean they're out for trans rights. They're not out for trans rights. You're being hoodwinked. Um, so <clears throat> at a time when our entire system is crashing, it's more important that they bamboozle us and they point us elsewhere. So where we sit is when it comes to China, oh, we've got to ban TikTok. And keep in mind something, and this is important. When you hear people talk about online censorship, right? Uh, I got to find an article for you. And it is, let me see. It's very important. Uh, this isn't critical because this is going to make my point. Let me show you this article. There's a number of things about this article that are of consequence. Let's look at this article. Trump launched CIA covert operation against China. Three former officials revealed that the CIA formed a small team of spies who used what? Fictitious online ident identities to build bad narratives about Xi Jinping's government, right? So they say the CIA, Trump allowed the CIA, as if they asked for his permission, to launch a covert operation on Chinese social media to turn public sentiment against the Chinese government, right? The CIA team fanned charges that members of the government were sheltering ill-gotten money overseas, blasted Chinese Belt Road Initiative, right? The odd activities within China were designed to instill fear among top authorities, pushing the government to devote resources to tracking incursions into Beijing's carefully regulated Internet, according to two uh, uh, former officials. Listen to this. We wanted them chasing ghosts, right? 
A Chinese foreign ministry spokesman stated the CIA program demonstrates how the U.S. government exploits public opinion space and media platforms as weapons to spread false information and manipulate international public opinion. Okay, so why is that critical? It's important because um, the CIA was in China. They were using fictitious identities and they were using China's social media to attack China. Why do I say that? Because Americans always flip out. Look what China's doing on social media. They're um, censoring on social media. Um, they don't have freedom on social media. And I have talked to people involved with that stuff. And they've said, look, what choice does China have? China is literally under attack by the United States on social media. You think Russia isn't? You think they're not doing it on VK? You think they're not doing it on Russian social media? So basically, it, so those who say China is censoring, what the hell would they do? Right. What else would they do? Why wouldn't China censor on social media? They damn sure better. The U.S. now admits we got the CIA on China's social media attacking China, trying to undermine China, going after the government, going after their projects, uh, et cetera. Right. So then why would you blame China for censoring social media there it's a war it's a dirty war on china it's a propaganda war against china on chinese social media china would be fools if they didn't go on social media and try to figure out what the u.s is doing and try to censor the hell out of it it's like this it's the same thing as this the u.s is dirty war on nicaragua when the u.s uh, it, it loads Nicaragua with all these NGOs, right? All these nonprofit, they call them non-government organizations. These nonprofit organizations, they fund them. They try to run candidates for president, etc. So Nicaragua came up with the equivalent of what is the U.S. Um, FARA, Foreign Agent Registration Act. And Nicaragua said, look, if you are a, a if you are a, a nonprofit organization, we now require you. We require you to tell us who where you're getting your money. You're required to do it. We need to know where you're getting your money. And if you don't tell us, we're going to lock you up. Well, all of these CIA funded nonprofits said we're not telling you. And Nicaragua said, well, we're going to arrest you and lock you up. Some of the people were running for. Think about this. You got people running for president in Nicaragua. And the Nicaraguan government says, you have an organization. We need to know where you're getting your money from. We now have a law in this country that says you have to tell us if you're getting money from outside of the country and where you're getting it from, which is not unreasonable because it is um, modeled after uh, the Foreign uh, uh, Registration Act, right? Pharaoh. And um, these people say, we're not going to tell you. They can't because they would have to say it was the CIA. And then Nicaragua says, well, A, we're going to arrest you. And B, you're not going to be able to run for president. And the U.S. goes, oh, my God, no freedom in Nicaragua. They're arresting their, uh, the, their the, the opposition. Nicaragua was doing a very, very smart thing. In fact, they were doing what the U.S. government does. Right. So what does the U.S. do now? The U.S. goes after China. They admit that they have CIA operations on in social media, on social media in China, attacking the Chinese government, trying to undermine the Chinese government. Right. And China says we're censoring our social media. You bastards are trying to take us out. Oh, my God. They got no freedom in China. They're censoring. Saying yeah, that's the game. Yeah, uh, they did it on uh, the Russian border in Georgia. All these NGOs in Georgia, they're trying to take down the government, put in a puppet government in Georgia so they can um, sacrifice Georgia in a proxy war, just like Ukraine. The, the Georgian government says, we don't want that. Oh, my God, look what they're doing in Georgia. Right. All of a sudden they're indignant. They can't believe that these countries are actually going to do what we do and and look at the uh, foreign funded uh, organizations and require them to say where they're getting their money. Bottom line is these that's that's China has no choice. If I was the president of China, I'd do the same damn thing. I'd say these people are admitting they're admitting that they're attacking us on social media. And when we say, hey, we're looking into uh, we've got to do some censoring here because we got our enemies on social media. You say, oh, my God, they have no freedom. They're searching. They're, they're doing that. And then, you know, what's interesting about the whole U.S. Um, arrogant attack on China as China grows and everything in China gets better and everything here goes to hell. And we pretend like we have the moral high ground to tell China what the hell to do. If you look at all the polls, over 90 percent of the people in China support their government. 
what what do we have here in the U.S.? Nine percent, right? Or maybe I don't know what the true numbers are, but trust me, it ain't over twenty. It probably ain't over fifteen. It's in the teens. I'll guarantee it. So the people in China think that their government is doing a good job, and the U.S. says we've got a the the, the Chinese government isn't doing a good job, and somehow a country that's thirty four trillion dollars in debt, somehow a country that is uh, racked with homelessness, racked with uh, crime and violence that um, our um, foreign policy in the region has destabilized the, the region to a point where there's a, a billion damn uh, immigrants on the border. And we in the United States, not only is it not going to stop the destabilizing operations in the region that's destabilizing these governments that's causing all of these people to come to the border, the U.S. doesn't know how to deal with them when they get to the border. So our country is a friggin' disaster. We got some guy who's wandering around and can't find his way off the stage, who is the figurehead that we got to pretend as though he's the president, backed up by somebody who has the IQ of a bag of ice as the vice president. And we somehow have a right to tell China how to run their government better. And they got 90% approval rating. And we got a bunch of idiots here who are so stupid that they can see the U.S. operation against Russia as a fraud and the dummies who buy into it, and they do the exact same thing when it comes to China. And they think they're smart. This country's crumbling to hell. It really is. So and let us continue. <clears throat> and might I add, I've talked to people recently who've been to Russia, and they're like, look, I, uh, uh, Tucker Carlson. They're like, man, walk the streets and the crime. Not much of a crime problem going on here in Russia. It's clean cleaning the streets up, didn't see any homeless people, went to the markets, they're stuffed with stuff, food, the people. I'm not saying the people in, 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 in Russia are rich by any stretch of the imagination, but somehow they seem to be able to feed their families and get an education. And um, it's a fairly conservative uh, country. So they're not, you know, flip going too far out when it comes to any particular cultural thing. They're taking their time and they're kind of happy with being, uh, uh, celebrating their um, religion and their traditional holidays, the way they like to do it. And they're happy. They got a president that they're happy with. They've got an economic system that's working for them. If you look at the Russian economic system, one can argue that it's, it's sim. I'll put it like this, similar to China. It is a hybrid system. I'm coming to the conclusion that hybrid systems got to work. If you look at Russia, what is it? They've got these gigantic companies that are owned by the government that sell oil and, and, um, gas and things like that they use that money to for the good of the country to run the country to buy things and the people aren't taxed to death because the government's actually making some money from corporations and that's what china does china just has 70 percent in china 70 percent of the uh, government of the economy is owned by the government and the other 30 percent is free market. That's the numbers that I get. I think the numbers are different in Russia. I don't know what they are, but a percentage is owned by the people, a percentage is owned by the government. And so therefore, and then some of them are hybrid systems where it's a combination of the government and the people. But let me say this, the government in Russia seems to support the corporations to make sure to keep them healthy. And what do you have? You have Russia and China that are not debtor nations right? They're not up to their ears in debt. They're able to pay their debt. They don't, they're not, their corporations are not zombie corporations. They don't use, they're not neoliberal capitalist governments and whatever they're doing, whatever form of hybrid economy they have, they're happy. The people are happy. They're eating. They're not, homelessness is not everywhere. They don't have mass shootings and crime everywhere. It's working for them. And the U.S. empire can't have that. The U.S. empire cannot. The four percent of the population is, is the U.S. And the U.S. feels. I, I was. I'll put it differently. I did say the U.S. feels that four percent should rule the other ninety-six percent, but that is is far worse than that because the four percent of the population here, the ruling elite in America, doesn't even answer to that four percent or look out for the interests of that four percent. So it's point zero 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 zero, and add a million zeros, one percent of the U.S. population feels like they should run, which of the uh, ruling elite here feels like they should run the entire world to the detriment, not only of the other countries, but to the detriment of the people, of the masses, of the working class right here, of everybody. That's what we're up against.
And so they this dirty war on China includes a constant um, uh, 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 um, online, uh, excuse it, 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 constant online attacks, as it was revealed by that particular article, and it 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 it, 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 it includes. Um, there have been, I put it like this, there were in Pakistan, part of the Belt and Road Initiative, where they were building some um, train tracks and some, you know, modes for moving, uh, you know, goods. Uh, there were bombs and some Chinese people were killed. You know, the CIA was involved in that. You know, they're doing clandestine operations to attack the Belt and Road. Bottom line, China and Russia build infrastructure. The U.S. Em the US empire blows up and destroys infrastructure. That's the difference. They're building infrastructure everywhere. We ain't even building it at home. Ours is falling apart. and We won't even build infrastructure right here. You know, we ain't building it around the world. We attack and blow up infrastructure and destroy it. They actually try to build infrastructure so they can expand their econ uh, economy. The, see, we uh, think about this. The U.S. does not need infrastructure. China and Russia do. Why? Because China and Russia produce. Russia uh, 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 has an in industrial uh, base, so they build things. They make things. You need infrastructure to move it. They have commodities, right? If you're um, mining things, if you're get bringing things out of the ground that need to be sold to other countries, you need infrastructure to move them. China has an industrial capacity. They're building things. They need um, ships and they need railroad tracks to move things. The U.S. is a financialized economy. We don't make nothing. What do we do? We make uh, complex financial tools and instruments on Wall Street and we flip things and we steal things and we rob things and we turn over and we middleman things where we buy this and we sell it cheaper and then we create fictitious money and we capital we create create things like uh, asset backed securities and stuff like that you do not need infrastructure walnut does walnut doesn't I mean excuse me walnut wall street doesn't need infrastructure now what else do we have we got Google, we got YouTube, we got things like that. They they don't need infrastructure to move anything. Only thing they need is some server somewhere, access to the internet. That's the game they play. So the things that's produced by the U.S., which is propaganda and censorship online by YouTube or uh, Facebook or Twitter, whatever the case may be, you do not need infrastructure to move that. The fictitious asset-backed securities and derivatives and all that, those kind of things, and um, the movement and flipping of capital by venture capital firms, you do not need infrastructure. So what has happened is, as the U.S. has become a, um, uh, what's the term, as the U.S. becomes a, basically a, a deindustrialized and a financialized in, in, economy, the need for infrastructure has dissipated. Even at home, when the U.S. built all of this infrastructure in the 30s and 40s and 50s, what was going on there? The U.S. had at one point 40 percent of the industrial capacity of the world. Some argue higher. When we were doing that, we needed, there's a reason that our electrical grid and all that stuff was built in the 40s and 50s and 60s, because that was the height of our industry. The U.S. did not build infrastructure for uh, the people. It built infrastructure for the military. The highway system was built so the military could move stuff around the highways, around the country easily. That was built for military purposes. The uh, uh, big factories that we had needed lots of, of electricity and they needed good, reliable energy and things like that. So the U.S. built a huge energy grid and the ability to move energy in a strategic oil reserve. What? Not for you and me. They built all of that so that the uh, corporations would have could guarantee oil and energy and all of the stuff they needed to run their corporations. Once the U.S. moved from a um, industrial base to a financialized uh, uh, base, there's no need for the infrastructure and they haven't built any since. And now that the U.S. is like, hey, the people are like, hey, we need an infrastructure. All they do is they come up with like some Biden type infrastructure bill, which really means we're going to sell off what little infrastructure we have left to the uh, uh, the venture capitalists so they can jack up the prices on roads and bridges and water and electricity. We're going to sell privatize everything 
so that now everything you do, the water that you, everything that you have will be owned by the corporations. Every All the money will go to the corporations and they won't. So let's face it. If the corporations have a bridge and they're charging you to cross the bridge, they got no. And, and, and might I add, who built that bridge? The U.S. government. You built the bridge with your tax dollars. They have no um, reason to improve the bridge. They just make money off the bridge until the bridge collapses and then go buy another bridge. They have no a reason to improve the water supply. And guess what else? Your water ain't going to be clean. They'll put God knows methyl ethyl horrible in the water. What do they care? It's a money making venture and there's nothing you can do to stop them. They are outside of the democratic process. So bottom line is the, the if you think about it, Russia and China, they're still digging commodities out of the ground that they need to move. They're still building things with industry that they need to move. They need to have a good, uh, solid, strong infrastructure uh, uh, program so that they can continue their industrial base and the people benefit off of it. Right. And of course, Russia and China, to some extent, uh, you got to add this. And this is critical. They're under attack from the U.S., and they need to defend themselves from the U.S. empire against these dirty wars. In order to defend themselves against the dirty uh, uh, the U.S. and the dirty wars, they have to have the people on board. They have to have the support of the people. They have to have the people as, um, what's the term that we use? Um, we want the people to be, the uh, buy it. That's the term. You need if you're going to have to do things to defend your country from U.S. imperialism, from U.S. dirty war attacks, you need buy in from the people in order to get buy in from the people. you got to provide things for the people. Right. you got to deliver the bacon. So in order for Russia and China to be able to fend off this dirty war attack, this imperialist attack from the U.S., they got to have the people on board, which means you got to give them something. You got to they got to have jobs. They got to have a clean society. They got to be happy with what's going on. They got to feel that the government is uh, protecting the their cultural views. Right. People that if you're a um, Orthodox Christian in Russia. If you're a Buddhist or whatever the hell in China, I don't know what there's various religions in China or various cultural things going on. You need to be able to feel as though the government at least respects that. And the people in China and Russia feel as though the, the government respects their cultural and historical views and needs. You heard uh, Vladimir Putin in the um, uh uh, 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 Tucker Carlton interview, talk a lot about historical issues and cultural issues. The people got to feel that their government is on board with their history and their culture and supporting them. That the government is, uh, you look in Russia, they're building new trains. They're building new, um, bottom line, infrastructure everywhere. Why? Because the people got to feel as though their lives are getting better. If you, if the government is going to be, have, have them on board in this, war that they're protecting themselves from from the u.s and western imperialism and that's so they're providing things for the people right the chinese and the russian government are keeping the people happy that's why there shouldn't be a surprise that vladimir putin has a 75 80 percent approval rating he has to the only way that he can that the russia can survive the dirty war from the U.S. is if they got buy-in from the people. So he has to bring home the bacon. He has to deliver a decent life for the people so that they're on board with this defensive war against U.S. imperialism. China, they got to build homes for the poor. They got to provide jobs for the people. They got to do everything they can to provide infrastructure, provide economic stability, food, all that kind of stuff, so that the people in China say, look, um, Things ain't bad. I support my government. So I'm on board. We're protect, we're, I'll put it like this. If you want the people on board with the government to defend China from imperialism and from a dirty war, the people in China have to feel that there's something in it for them that they're protecting. They got to feel that they're protecting their lifestyle, their cultural, their culture, their heritage, their ability to feed their families. If the, if nothing's not working out well for them, what are they there to protect? Why are they going to join in with the government? So, again, it's an incentive for the Chinese and the Russian governments to make sure that their people are happy so that they can join them in this uh, defensive action against imperialism against a dirty wars by uh, the U.S. empire and its proxies, its, va its vassals. And that's what we have here.
And Russia and China both understand it. Iran understands it. And Venezuela understands it. And Cuba understands it. It's because it's all the same dynamic. It's all the same dynamic. So those, you know, what's interesting, those who get will get on board with the CIA and the Biden neocons for any country. Right. You're if you're if you're in for a little bit, you're in for a lot. If don't think that the U.S. is going after Russia and you're like, oh, no, I don't like that. We're wrong going after Russia. But the U.S. imperialism, U.S. Um, neocons are going after Cuba are going after Venezuela are going after China. And you're on board with that one. But you're just not on board with the Russia venture that you're somehow doing the right thing. It's a, it's all the same thing. So if you will join the neocons and they're happy, they're happy. Basically, what they're doing is they're giving you a list of options. Right. And they're saying, look, we got a whole bunch of countries we're having dirty wars with. We got Cuba. We got Venezuela. We got Nicaragua. We got Iran. We got China. We got blah, 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 blah. We got all of these. Right. Here's the game plan. Pick one. We don't care which one. You can oppose some of them. Which one? Uh, Democrats, liberals. How 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 you, how you fixed on uh, Russia? And the liberals are like, yeah, well, I think we're good with that. Okay, here, Russia, that's yours. Support us on that operation. We're doing everything we can to pr prosecute our dirty war on Russia. Um, conservatives, libertarians. Hey, you know, China's communists. And uh, we know you guys are always have always been down with the anti-communism war, right? Yes, we have. All right. We got China. Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, all socialist countries. So how about you got you? OK, Russia, fair enough. You guys are won't join um, us neocons with that. We can live with that. But we'll take four for one. OK, Russia's only one country. How about we give you China? They're bargaining chips, right? Tell you what we'll do, conservatives and libertarians. We'll give you China. We'll give you Nicaragua. We'll give you Cuba. And since you're pro-Israel people, we'll throw in Iran. You don't have to support us on Russia. We'll give you these four. Will you do that? And the conservatives are like, that's fair enough. There's no difference. You're the same kind of tool. You're the exact same tool that's being used against Russia. You're just picking a different option. You want to do this or that? What do you want? You want, we got um, crack over here. We got heroin over here. We got meth over here. We got fentanyl over here. Pick one. Oh my God, fentanyl. That's dangerous. All right. How about how about meth? Yeah, give me some meth. I'll take that. Crack. I don't want that. How about you? Will you take crack? I'll take crack. You're all junkies. You're all the same thing. You're all a bunch of freaking junkies. The only question is, which what is your drug of choice? Some people, it's alcohol. Some people can have a drink and, and they're okay. Other people drink themselves to wipe and destroy their lives out. Their choice, their drug of choice is alcohol to destroy them li their lives and wipe themselves out. They're all an alcoholic is a junkie. They're all junkies. That's the bottom line. You're a junkie. And so what they said is, here's the drug. We got Russia. Nah, I don't want that drug. All right, we got several other drugs. Somebody might just say, I'll just take Cuba. Nah, I don't mind. I'll take Iran. Here, don't matter. Pick your drug of choice. Pick your drug of choice. Somebody said, no weed. weed weed's an herb, man. It's a natural herb. It ain't, it ain't, you know what I mean, unprocessed herb. And if you look at it, you take this much fentanyl, it kills you. You can smoke a fun five million joints every day in your life, a hundred times a day, and it ain't going to kill you. Weed is non-toxic. So no, I do not put weed and it can in the same category as these other things. But let me continue. Let me continue. But I'm making a point here. And the point is, there is a dirty war against um, Russia and China and lots of others, but I'm focused on Russia and China for this. But what is critical is in buy-in in the same way, and this is important, in the same way that Russia has to bring home the bacon. They have to deliver jobs. They have to deliver um, some level of, uh, of uh, safety so there's not high crime, the availability of food so you can buy food, what you need in the market. You can have a job. You can you have enough money to buy your food and you can buy your food in the market. And the market's loaded with fruits and vegetables and all the things you need. And there's clean streets and et cetera. And you can go to church and you can see, uh, you know, go to downtown Moscow or St. Petersburg during the holidays. And there's things are all brightened up and you feel as though your cultural um, needs are being met, your economic needs are being met, your safety needs are being met, boom, buy it. China, 
boom, you got buy-in. One thing, an interesting thing about China, and that was during COVID. So they went far, far overboard. And there were a lot of people in the West that said, oh my God, they went too far overboard. Well, I didn't like how far they were going, but I'm Chinese. It's up to the Chinese people, right? Here's something that was interesting and I, that, that I all should have learned from that. At some point, the Chinese people got fed up, right? At some point, the Chinese people were like, oh, crap, man, I'm sick of this freaking crap, right? And we, I've had enough. we had enough of it. So what was interesting is towards the end, there became a point where the Chinese people started protesting. They were like, all right, we're doing some more lockdowns and this and that. Chinese people were like, oh, crap on this. And we started seeing all of these protests. Protests were breaking out. It was, I think, it, I'll tell you what it was, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was somewhere around Omicron came out. Right. And everybody was Omicron was spreading everywhere. And the Chinese were like, oh, right, we got to do all this lockdown stuff on Omicron. And the Chinese people somewhere around that time flipped out. Right. Like we've had enough. This is we can't handle it. Right. And they started. And then the U.S. was like, look at this. China's falling apart. Uh, the people are in the street everywhere. They're protesting against their government. If you remember. When there were protests in Europe against the uh, the. Um, uh, uh, um, policies, the COVID policies, they called them far right idiots and the government went out and beat the hell out of them and sprayed them and all that kind of stuff, right? If there was something here, they, oh, they're far right QAnon morons and idiots. What kind of people would protest against the uh, government's uh, policies on COVID, right? Whether you agree with them or not, this is what happened. Right. So then somewhere around Omicron, the Chinese people got fed up and with the policies, they felt it was too much and they started um, going to the streets and the U.S. thought, oh, this is our opportunity now. We can prosecute our dirty work in China. And what we'll do is we will um, uh, 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 build on these protests, spread them out. And aha, now the color revolution in China. So they started building over the course of about a week and people were out and they had um, videos of people fighting the Chinese police and all that kind of like they were like, OK, we got the Chinese where we want now. Within a couple of days, the Chinese government dropped them. The Chinese government said, yeah, all right, we ain't doing none of that stuff. We're dropping it. And they dropped the, the, the lockdowns and all that. And if you think about it, what's happened since? The Chinese government stuff, like, ooh, just they like kind of turned down the volume on that because they saw it was going to be used against them, number one. And number two, the people were in the street. One could argue that the Chinese government, as you would expect, a government who represents the people, when the people got pissed and went to the streets, the Chinese government said, yeah, OK, we'll knock that off. And they stopped. They stopped the lockdowns. They stopped a lot of that crap, right? They they toned it down, not completely, but they toned it down to a point where the people stopped protesting. That's Isn't that how government's supposed to work? And look at what Russia did. When the when during COVID, when, you know, the West freaked out and, you know, they started coming up with these things you had to have on your phone to show that you were had the the the, the uh, vax and all that kind of stuff. Right. Russia never really went along with it. I think one of the things was Russia is a more conservative society. And they're like, yeah, we're, we're not going down that route. And they, they and the Russians are pretty wise. They looked at people in the streets. They saw that people there were a lot of there was a significant portion of the population that was unhappy with lockdowns and those kinds of things. And um, they're like, you know, this would be a pretty good opportunity for the West dirty war on us to expand and for color revolution. We ain't buying that. They Russia had like a couple weeks of lockdowns and they're like, screw this, let's go on about our business. And they went back to business and the people in Russia never really got pissed. One of the things I think that is critical now is that things in the West culturally, things in the West were destabilized a lot during um, COVID. A lot of people were very unhappy. They they built a new group, a new element in the popular in, in in within the population of the West who completely lost faith in the government, who lost trust in the government. And I think that echoes of that movement, if that's what it was, a movement is, the, I don't know if that's the right word of that group, echoes of that last today, that there are a lot of people, there was a, there's an element, I don't know what percentage, could be 1%, could be 10%. I'm not going to say, but I will say that there is an element that as a result of what was seen as draconian crackdowns during COVID, as a result of that, there's an echo through society of people who lost trust. And Russia didn't have to deal with that. And interestingly, China could have had to deal with that, except that when the people took to the streets, 
they shut the door on it. They turned off. They turned it off. They said, oh, ooh, 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 the people don't like it. People are getting pissed. Boom. And they know uh, countries know that anytime they start seeing people take to the streets organically for some some reason and that they start reading in the U.S. press. Oh, look at that. Look at looky. You know, the neocons are like, looky, looky. We got a bunch of people in country X and we don't like country X and they're taking to the street. We're all over it. Uh, governments have got to the point of this is they know they got to shut that down in a hurry and not using violence because that's what the um, dirty war uh, 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 feeds off of. It's setting up a dynamic where there's violence between the people and the government and they could destabilize that government and then encourage the people, hey, your government's using violence against you. And as we know from Maidan Square, when the government doesn't use violence, they'll false flag their way into it. They'll use the violence and try to blame it on the government. OK. Um, so bottom line, the bottom line is what we're looking at now is um, this is just the dirty war. The dirty war in Russia and dirty war on China is U.S. policy. It's U.S. foreign policy. That's how they do things. A lot of people are becoming wise to it. More and more people. Hopefully this video will wake some, will wake some people up and others will wake some people up. But this is on Russia. It's a dirty war. And the, 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 here's the key. People are getting hit to it and they're understanding how to deal with these dirty wars. Um, and Russia already knows why. Why does Russia have such great experience in the dirty war? Because of Syria. The U.S. launched a dirty war on Syria. They felt it would be a bit too much just to use knuckle dragon um, uh, uh, military means to go after Syria. I think they also understood that if they went into Syria and fought, that they'd be sitting there and that Iran would empower its allies and arm its allies, that if the U.S., they'd be sitting ducks, right? And we can see that now from what's happening in um, uh, 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 God, in, 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 in occupied Palestine, right? That the um, Syrian and Iraqi and Lebanese um, resistance is able to strike the U.S. They're really able to strike um, um, Israel at uh, at will, and that if the U.S. had used military might and attacked the Syrian government and taken over Syria, that they'd have to occupy it. And at that point, they'd be sitting ducks and that the resistance forces would pound them day and night. And now that they, the drone war, really, the drone wars have gone worldwide and in areas of conflict, or the drone wars are really dominant now. Drone, drone uh, war is dominant now. The U.S. would have been pounded day and night had they went and occupied Syria. And if they occupied Syria, they'd never be able to leave ever, never, ever, ever. And they would be occupying Syria. They'd be occupying Iraq. And at that point, they'd have also been occupying Afghanistan. It would have got to the point where the U.S. had to use troops to occupy all of Middle East the Middle East, and those troops would have been sitting ducks. So they couldn't do it. They were the knuckle draggers, one and two. Obama, for all of his evil machinations, was smart. Was a pretty smart guy. He was a, an evil guy in my point. He was an imperialist. He was a, you know, one of, you know, he was an evil dude in my opinion, but he was not a stupid evil dude. He was probably the smartest neocon. And he, I would say he was neocon light. He was the, the I'll, I'll go one further. As neocons go, Obama was a wise neocon. Obama, had they went along with what uh, Obama tried, you know, they just attacked Syria right now. I mean, when they wanted to, when Obama wouldn't do it, had they attacked Syria, they'd have been occupying Afghanistan, occupying Syria, and occupying Iraq all at the same time. It would have been overwhelming. It would have weighed the U.S. empire down. It would have been too expensive. And they'd have lost a lot of troops because the, uh, the uh, resistance would have been able to bang them day and night. They'd be sitting ducks all over the place. They'd be in a world of trouble. And they could hit them anywhere in those three countries. And let's not forget when it came to Ukraine that Obama is the one that said, hey, the Russians will always have escalatory dominance. He did not want to arm Ukraine. He knew better than to use Ukraine on a Russian border as a knife at Russia's throat. He knew that would never work. He said it would be uh, this is, you know, basically um, existential to Russia, but not to us. And Russia will do whatever they have to keep. So, as I said, was he an evil neocon? Yes, but he was a pretty wise guy. If you think about it. he wasn't an idiot.
which means if you think about it, which you mean, which means that Obama was a more dangerous neocon than the brand of neocons that we have. Because why? Because if you have a smart and wise person, they're more dangerous than a freaking idiot. If you're going up against somebody, you prefer to go up against the idiot and give that a smart and wise guy who has, Obama knew how to use some level of restraint within the context of his evil, right? That's gonna be more effective. These knuckleheads don't know how to do use restraint. They don't have an idea. So they just run right straight on into a wood chipper is what they're doing. So what you have now is what Russia was able to do is take the lessons that it learned from the dirty war in Syria, right? And transfer them into Ukraine so much for so that they even had um, some of the generals. They've even used some of the people who had experience in Syria in Ukraine. Remember, one of the things at the very beginning, they tried to use a Syrian tactic. Excuse me for yawning. Oh, what they tried to do was to, you know, let the Ukrainians know we can hit you hard and then to, to um, negotiate. That's what they did with these ISIS, some of these ISIS people. They surrounded them, they bombed them, and they said, well, you got an option. We'll kill all of you. Or you can get on these buses and leave and go to Italy or wherever the hell and give this area back. And a bunch of the ISIS people said, yeah, I guess that's probably a good idea. So that's kind of what the special military operation started off. And if you think about it, it was initially successful. They scared the hell out of uh, the Ukrainians. And Zelensky et al. said, let's negotiate. It worked. The issue was the U.S. empire stepped in and said, "We ain't there'll be no negotiating here. We're going to use you as a weapon against Russia. We've sharpened this knife up and we want to use it to cut Russia. Ukraine is a, is a tool, it's a knife that's been sharpened, and damn it, we're going to use this sharpened tool to slash Russia's throat. They used it, but it, it, was, it, did, it didn't work. Russia was far too strong now, and they've got a lot of experience. So keep in mind, what Russia, what the axis of resistance in um, uh, allies of Russia in the Middle East, what they have is they've got experience from the dirty war in Syria that they won. Russia has experience from the dirty war in Syria that it won, and it can share those things with China. And of course, China can see and other people can see how Russia and the Axis of Resistance won the dirty war in Syria, and they can use the historical context to um, have success in Ukraine and, of course, Taiwan, because it's the same game. Ukraine, Taiwan, and what I'll add this, and what India doesn't realize, if if the leaders of India were wiser than they are now, I don't know, maybe they're wiser than I realize, but it doesn't seem this. What they would know is it's coming to Kashmir, that that's the game, that what the U.S. empire does as it sees a rising world power, which India is clearly a rising world power, they find a way to come to your border and to use some historically controversial land, borderland to export, exploit and to use that as an excuse to bring their troops in to arm that and to use that to destabilize your country. They're doing it to you with Ukraine. They're doing it to Taiwan. And at some point in the future, the Kashmir region between Afghanistan, I'm mean, excuse me, Pakistan and um, and uh <clears throat> Uh, India will be used against India. And, you know, when people say, people discuss the fact that the U.S. government overthrew the Pakistan government and took control of the U.S., U.K., took control of the Pakistan government. Um, and it was because the leader of Pakistan, Imran Khan, was too close with the Russians. That's part of it. The other part of it is an eye to the future. They understand that the time will come when they're going to need to use the Kashmir region as the um, Ukrainian slash Taiwan proxy region to go after the in growing world power of India. And when they they need to do it, they want to have Pakistan in their back window so they can use Pakistan as Ukraine. They already know Pakistan and India has problems, so Pakistan will be Ukraine at some point, which of course would end up in what? Clearly, it would end up with a nuclear with a nuclear confrontation in exchange between the two, and that's probably what they want. They want to, you know, there's if they are are able to get India and Pakistan to get in a nuclear confrontation and destroy India, then boom, they're done. That's finished. We've got India off the board, off the chessboard. They're no longer a threat on anybody else around. It could be a threat. We got to control them. Let's move on.
That's their game plan. What do they care? Right. So I, Russia and China have figured that out. If at some point India gets wise enough to understand it, um, they're the next meal, the next planned meal. They won't actually be the next meal, but the next planned meal, they would get on board with Russia and China full throated in a manner to try to um, keep uh, the U.S. empire and uh, the West off their back. I think one of the problems that the West has here is that um, because they are going after world powers now, their proxies of Europe, which Europe is to some extent, it's Ukraine, it's Taiwan, it's being sacrificed in the same way. Um, the dynamics created by this confrontation always wipes out the proxy. It always destroys the proxy. That's part of the plan. So Ukraine, the Ukraine, Ukrainization of Taiwan and the Ukrainization of all of Europe certainly wipes out Europe and Taiwan at some point if they're able to uh, expand and to act on and continue with their evil and diabolical plan. And I think the question we have to see raise here is in the same way that I say it is critical for Russia and China to bring home the bacon, to deliver stability, economic stability, to the stability from crime, cultural stability for their people in order to get the buy-in that they need from their people, to um, help them and to support the defensive uh, uh, war that they're fighting against the U.S. Uh, neocons in order, in just in the same way that it's important for them to do that, to get buy-in from their population and support from their population. In order, the West needs it too, in order to prosecute the war, in order to go after these gigantic uh, military and economic powers, the neocons need buy-in from the American people and the neocons and ruling elite in Europe need buy-ins for the Europe from the European people. The problem is they're not protecting their cultural, their economic, their basic safety, all of those things. They're not protecting any of that. In fact, in the same way that the ruling elite are going to war and attacking the economic and the safety and the cultural needs of the people in their adversaries, Ironically, they're doing the same thing with their own people. They're attacking the culture of their own people. They're attacking the economy of their own people. They're ignoring the safety needs of their own people, right? The educational needs of their own people. So they're getting the opposite of buy-in. So what we end up with here at some point, what we end up with is a Russia, a China, and other countries who have a, a pretty good level of support from their people and an understanding from their people that they're under attack from the neocons. And at some point, we end up with the opposite of buy-in in Europe, in um, in the U.S., where the U.S. government and the ruling elite are at all-out total war with their people. We're pretty much there. We're too, pretty much there in Europe and in the U.S. And we're pretty much there because the bottom line is the ruling elite in, the, in, in America knows that Trump will win. At this point, I'm pretty sure. Basically, and my, my, the strength of my belief, conviction that Trump is bound to win comes from the black community. You know, remember, and this is critical. The black community in America has a history of supporting the Democrats and they're sick and tired of the damn Democrats. They're wising up. They realize they've been lied to, had schnook, took. And so a significant percentage of the people in the black community are saying we had it with these people. They lied to us. They do us dirty. We, we, we're done with them. So you're going to get one of two things. You're going to get in the black community the same thing, same exact thing that you're getting in the everywhere else. An element that says, I'm sick of these. I don't like the Republicans. I'm staying home and rake leaves on election day. And you're getting a bunch of a lot of black people that are saying things economically, right? They're working class people and they're saying, look, and this is what I hear. I'm not saying I'm in favor of it or I support it. I'm saying what I hear. Things are better under Trump. I think I'm going to support Trump. So you get a percentage, you get percentages. So if you get a big chunk of, of black voters that say, and Latino voters that say, I'm staying the hell home. I'm not supporting any of these morons. You get a percentage like me that says I'm voting third party. I don't support the, you know these morons. You get another percentage that says I'm just going to vote Trump. I'm tired of the system and maybe something will happen with him that didn't happen with these other people. You get all of these elements. This critical voting block for the Democrats is starting to dissolve and, and dissipate, which means the Democrats will dissolve and dissipate along with them. Um, and that's where the direction we're going here. 
not buy in the opposite of buy in. The neocons and the ruling elite in the US and in Europe cannot continue their um, rampage around the world if they not only don't have buy in, but they're now getting opposition from the masses and the working class. And I think that's the direction that we're having. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. Somebody said black supporters supporters don't support Cornell West. Well, no, because for this reason, I mean, he'll get a, a tiny percentage. But in order to get the support, we're talking people who are practical voters. Right. And so they're not like, hey, I'm going to support Cornell West because he's black or something like that. They're looking at Cornell West as a um, as an uh, as a political option, saying, is this a realistic political option? No, he's not. He's jumped from I like Cornell West. I think he's a nice person. I mean, um, when you talk about motivations, right, why is a person doing this or that? I've had my criticisms of Cornell West for one reason or another, and you can criticize me. Everybody should be open to criticism. But what I'll say about Cornell West and what I know about him is he's a, a loving person. He's a kind person. He comes from the history of the Martin Luther King kind of thought, loving other people and blah, blah, blah. And so I think he can be a bit naive when it comes to the U.S. empire. He can be a bit naive into not fully believing and understanding just how evil these rat bastards are. Um, but in a black community, he's not viewed as a viable political option because he's not a viable political option. And so, no, he's not getting support simply because he's not a viable political option. If he was polling in 25, 30 percent, sure, not because he's black or not because he's Cornell West, but because he'd be a viable political option. We're talking people who vote their pocketbook more often than not, or what they consider to be their pocketbook and what they consider to be a practical vote. And now they're looking at the options they have. And a lot of them see the Democrats as not a practical option. And so they're out of there. They're looking for other options, but they're not going to just vote for any schmuck on the street who happens to run in and say, hey, I'm black, vote for me, ain't going to work. That's not happening. They're pretty, pretty, can be, can, they can be pretty practical voters. Um, bottom line is, as I'm saying though, you're good. So what you end up with is this. Let me let me sum it up. What you end up with is a group over here that says we um, support our government because they're bringing home the bacon. And that ends up Russia, China at et al., or at least making every effort they can. You end up with another group supporting the in the U.S. empire, the working class, the masses in the U.S., in Germany in France in the U.K. who say, I'll vote for damn George Galloway or anybody. I need out. I need another option because this ain't working for me. I don't I don't support my government. I don't have buy in. So you have the government going after these superpowers without buy in from their people versus superpowers who are defending themselves from these tax attacks who do have buy in for their people. I think that's the difference. But thanks a lot, everybody. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a look and see, as we like to do, if there's super duper duper chats. And if I see any, which I don't really see any super chats, which is fine. Oh, there's some here and there, and they're always good questions. Aaron Tiana says, any sign the U.S. and Russia have already negotiated and the people going crazy, e.g. are not in a loop? Nah, I don't think that that's the case. I think um, Russia's doing their thing, and they're like this. Russia has decided that they're going to force uh, their will on the West. They're like, this is what we got to do. I think Russia's come to the conclusion Ukraine is a threat. We're going to neutralize the threat and let the West do what they're going to do. I think that's where they are. Um, they, they don't, they're not negotiating. It's going to be difficult. I mean, let's face it. Would you negotiate with Blinken and Biden and those people? No, because you know, the second you walk away from that negotiation, that they're not going to keep their word. So no, Russia's not negotiating with people that aren't going to keep their word. Great question. Thanks a lot. Let me see if there's any other questions. We got, there's uh, not seeing a lot of super chats, but that's fine. If you got a question, put in a super chat and I'm going to do it now. Sparky says, great video. Thanks a lot there, Sparkster. Certainly appreciate that. How about we get to John Jonathan Soul says, even U.S. tech infrastructure is falling apart. No willing government or countries to secure cable routers, et cetera. It, well, it's at, exa exactly that you're, you're right. You're hundred percent. Good, good, good uh, observation there. All right. Oh, how about we got here? Uh, Conan, super sticker. Thanks a lot, Conan. Any other ones? Here we got uh, Vivian1124 says, why are the Republicans going against TikTok? Well, bottom line is this. There's a couple of things. When you start understanding that this bill has nothing to do 
with TikTok. It's not related to TikTok. Um, let me see if I can find something for you. Again, this is uh, critical. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, there's an article. Here we go. Oh, if I could find it, there's an article. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I, I got to find this. Uh, Representative Gallagher wrote an article. And it was something about why Hamas. Here we go. This tells you what's this about. Let's look at this. Uh, this was a op-ed written before any of this started happening by Representative Mike Gallagher, right? You want to understand this TikTok thing? Watch this. Let me show you something. Why do young Americans support Hamas look at TikTok, right? And here's what he says. The app is, come on, maybe later. He says, the app is digital fentanyl made by China, and it's brainwashing our youth against the country and our allies, right? So Hamas, TikTok. But when was this? November 1st. This was before they even ta started talking about this legislation, isn't it? So one of the things, if you start really looking into it, you'll find that a guy named Jonathan Greenblatt with the ADL um, recently made some statements about Hamas and TikTok. Well, well, there's a lot of young people on TikTok and a lot of young people are opposed to the genocide in Gaza. And so um, APAC and these other groups started making noise saying we got to shut down TikTok because there's a lot of opposition to Israeli foreign policy on there. So a big part of focusing on TikTok is because the wired Republicans supporting it because the Zionists want it shut down because it's a place where young people can express their opposition to Israeli foreign policy. That's a big part of it. Now, um, the other part of it is if you start reading into this, you'll find that this is not a TikTok bill. It says nothing to do with TikTok. If you remember after 2001, I mean, after 9-11, uh, immediately after 9-11, they did uh, release the Patriot Act. And the Patriot Act was what? It was something that was written before 9-11 to um, be a, give the uh, government uh, more power to crush our, um, the privileges, I'll call them, that we get from the um from the uh, Constitution, our constitutional privileges, our rights and freedoms and things like that. We call them, I call them privileges because if they were rights and freedoms, the government couldn't get rid of them on any given Tuesday. Well, that was all planned. Well, now this TikTok bill, if you read it, it doesn't say TikTok. It says foreign adversaries. And it allows, when you start looking at it, you, you, this is another way that the government, another thing that the government is going to use for crackdown and censorship. And they're going to say, oh, rumble, uh, rock fins, anything that um, goes against um, the uh, neocon warmonger CIA um, uh, uh, driven media and propaganda has to be stopped. It's Russia, it's China, it's Iran. That's all this is. This is a way to shut down people like me and you who like to have discussions that are outside of the allowable uh, Overton window of the intelligence community. So though this is not a TikTok ban, this is um, another erosion of our privileges and rights. And this is also a reaction to the um, Israeli, the Ziocons, you want to call them, right? This is another reaction to them saying we're unhappy with Americans having the opportunity to voice their opposition to um, Israeli foreign policy. That's why. That's why. That's what it is. And that's the whole nine yards. Let me see. Is there anything else? How about here? How about we go here? Anas Bella 
she have says Putin said mean things about vampires. I've never seen such hysterical hatred after that interview. Well, that's the game. That's but you know the hysterical hatred. That's part of the dirty war. So get used to it. Part of the dirty war is hysterical hatred. Let's go to Rockfit. See what we got there. Um, Thirty two watching. Thanks a lot, everybody. Uh. Now, this is something interesting. Jim Hatch says Trump's family is doing loads of business with China, but that won't stop Trump from. Well, bottom line is this. Of course he is. And so are you. And so am I. We're all doing loads of business with China. China is the world's uh, industrial base, industrial power. And if you're doing if you're buying stuff, you're buying stuff from China. If you're running a business, you're buying stuff from China. We're all doing business with China, which is great. Do business wherever you can. I believe, you know, what's funny. I'm not a free marketeer person at all. I believe in a regulated market. Right. But I'm more of a free marketeer than the so-called free marketeers, because I say, if you can do business with China, do business with China. If you can do business with Russia, anybody you can do business. With. I don't believe in any of these um, uh, the government coming in and saying you can't do business with China or Cuba or Russia or Nicaragua or Venezuela. I believe everybody should be able to do business. If I want to start a business, I should be able to do business with any damn body I want to. Right. So I'm more I'm a anti free marketeer, to, to be quite frank. I believe that the whole free market crap is a ruse. It's a lie. It's a fraud. And as we're seeing now, the so-called free marketeers don't believe in it because they're shutting down the free market all over the world. Well, you can't do business with them, 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 or them. Any free market, right? So um, bottom line is, yes, you're going to do business with China if you're going to do business. That's like saying, well, he's buying gas. He's doing business with Saudi Arabia. Well, if you're buying uh, gas for your vehicles or diesel fuel, at some point you're doing business with Saudi Arabia. That's the nature of the game. All right. Uh, I think that's it. I really do believe that's it. Let me try just check Rumble for Rumble rants. Because it God knows my dear Rumbleians. Uh my content. Let me look. Let me see if I can go there. I don't even know if it's on. Maybe it's not even working. Who knows? I don't even know if Rumble the hell. I can't keep up with Rumble. Maybe it's not working. Um, anyway, if it is, I'll upload it. If it's not, I'll just upload this video to Rumble lately, later on. Thanks a lot, everybody. Certainly appreciate it. I got to run. Got important things to do. I got. Um, I would have liked to have been on um, Galloway today. They asked me to go on Galloway today, but I got some stuff I got to do somewhere. I got to go this afternoon, so I couldn't. Hopefully, I'll be on soon. Do me a favor, everybody. Um, number one. You can see everything scrolling across the bottom, whether it's Patreon or PayPal. Buy me a coffee is always great. Buy me a coffee. You just go there and it'll say, buy a garland of coffee. How much? Five bucks, right? And um, how many coffees you want? And you can actually do like Patreon on buy me a coffee and say, I want to be a monthly subscriber. So buy me a coffee is a great option, of course. Um, don't forget to follow me on Rumble. Follow me on Telegram. Also, rockfin.com. Rockfin's great. You can go there. Um, I, every now and then I put some of my stuff on premium and, um, but anybody can become a member. It's mostly free, but I put some stuff here on premium. And, um, if you want to be a member, excuse me, a member, it costs nothing on Rockfin. If you want to be a subscriber, $14.99 a month. So if you can afford to be a subscriber on Rockfin, I would appreciate it. If you can't just become a member, watch my stuff for free. Last but not least, um, uh, political superfood. That's my, um, Substack, and I'm starting to do a little wake up my Substack. I'm going to start to write a weekly article on that. So if you can go to Substack, I would appreciate it. You can just become a free member, or you, I think it's 50 bucks a year or something. Was that four dollars a month or something like that? Um, I believe you can sign up for that. So thanks a lot, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Share those or this on all your social media platforms. Peace. I'm out.